For this problem, I want you to assume that the upper limit of integration k here is a constant greater than zero, and recognize that in the integral expression itself, because you have both sine of x and also cosine of x dx, it doesn't matter what this power of n is here. Either way, we can use a trick known as the u substitution method. So the thing I want you to recognize is that if I set u as sine of x, and du is simply going to be cosine of x dx after taking the derivative of both sides, you're going to notice that this becomes a very simple integral that transforms into a polynomial integral. Now, in this video, there are two key mistakes that can be easily made here. Number one, you're going to notice that if you use the original integrals, integral limits, which are going to be 0 and k, that's actually wrong. What do you think they should be? Tell me below. Okay, remember that the limits of integration here were in terms of x. So we need to transform them to be in terms of u because we've transformed this variable x into a variable u. And the way you want to do this is that because x equals 0 was the lower limit of integration, if I take this expression u equals sine of x, simply plugging in 0 for x would mean that u is sine of 0, which is simply 0. And when I repeat this for the upper limit of integration, x equals k, plugging that in, you will get u equals sine of k. And if you want to learn more tips and tricks to avoid errors like these in the future, make sure to like this video and ninja kick that subscribe button so you become a ninja today. All right, so moving forward, we now have the limit as n approaches infinity of u to the n du's integral from 0 to sine of k because we've transformed everything in terms of u here. And realize too here that n is approaching infinity. That doesn't change. Just because we transformed x to u, we don't have to do anything with this n term because we didn't touch it above. So remember, taking the integral of u to the n itself is 1 over m plus 1 times u raised to the m plus 1 plus c. But I'm dropping the plus c term here because it's a definite integral, and it would go away anyhow due to subtraction from the upper limit of integration, the lower. And speaking of those limits of integration, the way you solve this, if you don't remember, that's okay. But you just take the upper limit of integration, which is sine of k, you plug it into u here, and whatever that expression is, you subtract it where you repeat the step of now plugging in the lower limit of integration, which is zero, giving you this final expression. And I put brackets here to make sure that my order of operations are correct. So we'll have the upper limit of integration sine of k being plugged in here for u, giving you 1 over m plus 1 times in parentheses, sine of k, all raised to the m plus 1, minus plugging in u equals zero. And that's nice because that just goes away. When you simplify this further, you're going to get the limit as n approaches infinity of sine of k, all raised to the m plus 1, all over m plus 1. Ah, this is the part where most of us are going to get this wrong, and I'm guilty of this too, and it's why I made this video to help you guys out. You might be wondering, oh, Dave, sine of k goes from negative 1 to 1, and it oscillates. This limit does not exist. And part of your observation is correct. Sine of k does oscillate, but it's a mistake here to just quit solving the problem and just claim that the limit doesn't exist. There's a really nifty trick here you're about to learn called the squeeze limit theorem. And I want you to notice that yes, sine of k is cyclical. It doesn't matter how large n is here, it's gonna keep resulting in sine of k going from negative one to one. But you know what's cool is with the squeeze limit theorem here, what we can do is the following. What we can say is that if I can rewrite this expression as an inequality, where the limit we're trying to solve is sandwiched or squeezed between something smaller and something greater, where the smaller and greater parts have a convergent value, we might be able to actually show the limit does exist. So what I'm going to do is for the inner part of this inequality expression, I'm going to use the original problem we're working with. And notice that in the numerator, we have that sine of k raised to the m plus 1. And for the lower and upper bounds here, what I'm going to do is, because I know the range of sine of k goes from negative 1 to 1, I'm simply going to plug those values in and keep the denominators the same. Now, one observation you might make is, uh, Dave, if negative 1 is raised to the m plus 1, that could result in positive 1 or negative 1, depending on what n is. And that's totally correct. But we don't care about that here, because if it's negative 1, the power just goes away. And if it's positive 1, well, we're already covering that in this upper bound on the right-hand side, right? And because 1 raised to the m plus 1 is always going to be 1, with that said, we can just simply drop the powers that we're raising negative 1 and 1 to, leaving us with this simpler expression, where on the lower bound we have the limit as n approaches infinity of negative 1 over m plus 1. And similarly, on the upper bound, the numerator is 1. 
Now, what do you remember about taking the limit as n approaches infinity of a constant divided by an expression such as n plus 1? And the hint here is that the numerator is not changing, but the denominator is vastly growing. Leave a comment. Tell me what you think it is. Okay, remember, when you take the limit as n approaches infinity, you don't have to do this, but it might help you to visualize it. Remember that if the constant is on the numerator, you can rewrite the limit as if the constant was brought outside of the limit, multiplied by the limit where the numerator is 1, right? So in the left-hand side, it's the same as negative 1 times the limit as n approaches infinity of the expression 1 over n plus 1, and we already have that on the right-hand side. But it doesn't matter. Because the constant is not growing, it doesn't matter how large the constant is. As n vastly grows without bound, eventually the denominator is going to just overtake the numerator and the expression will just converge to zero. And so what that means then with this squeeze theorem is that the lower bound is a convergent value of zero, just like the upper bound. And guess what? If our limit expression is converging between zero and zero, your answer is going to be zero inches.